Hi, I want to welcome everyone who's gathered today on YouTube or here live on Zoom. I'm Lynn Hardy, and this is The Living Word. Okay, today we are talking about our authority. This is part of the free online courses, um, the class Traps When Praying, Part 1. This is about removing attacks. They're available at the online Christian church. And today, we want to talk about our authority so we know what authority we do have and what authority we don't. Yes, there is authority that we do not have. We need to know if there are limits on man's authority on the earth because we need to understand if there are consequences for stepping outside of our rightful authority. Perhaps the question to begin with is this. Once we are Christians, can our wrong actions be held against us? In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, we see this. There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So how many of you have heard that there is no condemnation in Christ so we don't have to worry about what we're doing. We don't really have to worry um, about our actions because we, we can't be condemned for them. How many of you have heard something similar to this? While this verse does say there's no con condemnation for Christians, there is a stipulation which is often left out. It's which Christians are not being condemned. It's those who are walking after, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The flesh is our natural inclinations in life. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, all mankind were born in the flesh or in, with a temptation, a, a nature towards sin. This verse does not say that we can do anything we want or that sin in our lives is acceptable. It says that if we are walking with the Spirit of God, then there is no condemnation because the Holy Spirit will lead us out of sin. So to find out what specific type of condemnation this is referring to, we must continue reading. So let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. This is later on in that same chapter, chapter 8 of Romans. And this shows us what kind of condemnation Paul is speaking of. He's talking about the consequences of sin by which we are sent to hell when we die. Remember, at this time, um, it was believed and it was, it was true for Jewish Christians that if they broke any part of the law, they would go to hell for doing so unless they had a sacrifice. So Paul is just trying to show them that there is no condemnation once you receive Jesus, you receive the Spirit, and you're walking after the Spirit. At this time, there were Christians that were being persecuted. They were being hung on crosses and fed to lions. The apostles who founded the church were reassuring Christians that in the end, all would be okay if they clung to their faith in Jesus, that they would be raised from the dead into heaven. That is the condemnation that is being spoken of. It's not saying that there are no consequences for our sins in this lifetime. It's not saying that it won't let the enemy attack us here and now. It's saying that don't worry that when you cling to the Holy Spirit and Jesus and you try and walk with them, then at the end, you won't be condemned. You'll be raised and go to heaven. Many times, this verse is combined with another one. Let's read that in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. This is the NIV version here today. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. So many claim that because there's no condemnation, because we are 
working with God. We are co-laborers with him. So that means everything is permitted for us. We have all authority because we're co-laboring with God. So we have God's authority. Is that what this scripture is saying? To really understand what this co-laboring with God is. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 5 and 7. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. It is God who allows the work we do to prosper and grow. It is God who allows the faith to grow to maturity. Any servant, any minister of God who is taking credit for the work is not truly working with God because we give all the glory to God for without him, there is no growth. Remember, it says that we are God's field. We are his building. Well, someone plants the field. That's God. Someone erects the building. God is the director, not us. For our work to grow, we need to be sure that we're doing what God wants us to do. Let's look at Matthew 28, 18 to 19 for some words from our Lord. It says, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore, teach and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. This is, these are the words of our Lord. And because of what I was taught for many years, I believe that all authority was given to me because so many people said it. But recently, well, not recently now, <laughs> a few years back, God showed us that that assumption is not supported by the word of God. Jesus isn't saying, I give you all power. He says, no, all power is given to me. And therefore, you go, you go and do what I'm telling you to do, and I'm going to clear the path for you. Jesus was the only one given all authority after he rose from the grave because he lived the perfect life, because he died. And at the, at the cross, at the horrible, horrible torture of the cross, he was given all authority for that. We we're not given all authority. I urge you to check the word of God. See if you can see in there any scripture that states we have been given all authority because I could not find one. All I could find was that Jesus has all authority. So he sends us out underneath him. He is the one with all authority. We just do what he tells us to do. I began asking myself some of these questions. If an earthly king has authority. Do those under him who call him Lord have the very same authority he has? How about the heirs to a king? Do they wield the exact same power as the king? Why would we assume that we have the exact same authority as our heavenly king? If that isn't true, even here on earth, remember Jesus knows all things. We do not. Why would we assume that we get all authority instead of needing to listen to him? So with those questions in mind, let's look at Romans 8 verse, verse 17 says this. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Since we are joint heirs with Christ, it is often assumed that we have the exact authority Jesus does. But here is the second half of this verse that many leave out. This is still Romans 8, 17. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified, we may also be glorified together. This is the right context for this verse. Paul is making a statement about enduring suffering here on the earth because we are joint heirs with Jesus and will be glorified him when, when we die because he rose from the grave. Remember, you inherit something and receive your inheritance from someone else when you, when they die. So Christians at this time were 
giving their lives for the Lord. They refused to deny Christ on, on the pain of suffering and torture. So Paul was encouraging them that their future, when they die, they would get the inheritance with Jesus and be with him in his glory. So as we continue looking at our authority, the next place we want to look is what position do we hold in the heavens? What kind of authority do we have in the heavens? In Ephesians 2 verse 6, this is a New King James Version. It says this, and he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This verse is often quoted, and a huge leap is taken that says that because we are seated with Jesus in heavenly places, we have the same authority, we have the same seat that he has, that we can even command things in the heavens because we are seated in the heavens with Jesus. There are zero examples from the Bible of people commanding things in heaven from the earth. Remember, Jesus is our Lord. We have what the Lord gives us and what is stated in the Bible. And we can even follow his example of what he did on the earth. Did Jesus ever command things in heaven when he was on the earth? We see no examples of this. So we must keep re reading in Ephesians to find out what this is speaking of, of being seated in heavenly places. So we're going to continue with Ephesians 2, verses 7 and 8. Here is the King James Version for you today. So I'm going to go back to 6. I'm going to read it all together so you can see it lined up. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. This, this is what it's talking about. This is the position we hold in Christ. It isn't that we're seated in heavenly places so we can have all authority. It is saying that it's God's grace is being displayed by our right standing in heaven, our, the grace given to us in heaven, by what Jesus has done, the fact that we can come boldly before God and ask him for things. The topic here is our salvation through faith that comes through the grace of what Jesus has done. The topic isn't our power and authority. To add to this verse that we have the same and equal authority as Jesus is very presumptuous. Think about it this way. If millions of Christians on this planet could actually see what all the demons, principalities, and, and dominions were doing in the heavens, would we really know what to do with them? If everyone tried to bind and loose them according to the portion of, of what they were seeing, there would be total chaos. Imagine you're a heavenly being doing your work that God's assigned you in heaven and these little earthlings who only see in part, you're getting instructions from five different places about what to do in heaven. That would be chaos. Likewise, with God's armies and powers, they belong to God. Why would we think that we know better about when and how to command them? As I said, we wouldn't know if they already had an assignment from God. We wouldn't know if they were acting according to his will. Our authority is on planet earth. We must remember that and stop trying to tamper with the spirit realm. In Luke, when Jesus sent out his disciples, they were to preach the gospel and prepare the way for Jesus by breaking Satan's authority and ready people to receive him. They returned so excited that the power and authority they wielded in his name, and they explained this in Luke this is verse 10 or chapter 10, verse 19, the American King James Version. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall any means hurt you. When we look at this, we see that the word power is used two times in this verse. It is used for two and, and each time it's used in this verse, it's a different Greek word. The power to tread is exousia. This means it, the power to rule, the authority, specifically over mankind, 
because of judicial degrees. You must know what God is doing as judge. It's his decrees that you're lining up with. Then the other one, all power of the enemy. So this is the power that Jesus is saying that his servants can overcome. It's the word dynamis. That's where the word dynamite comes from. It is the creative power to do miracles. The creative power and influence that come comes with wealth or the power of an army. So before the Lord sent out his disciples, he sent them to a specific place for his purpose. And they were given power, that is a legal judicial decree. They were given a writ of authority from Jesus over the power of the enemy. That is that dynamic power that the enemy was wielding to subject people to his rule. Remember, they were given specific tasks to do to prepare the way for his coming. And they were empowered by the Lord to, for the job to be done. The references to serpents and scorpions is strictly metaphorical here. It's not literal. Because there are no examples in the Bible of somebody walking on serpents or scorpions. No, in the Bible, serpents are often, uh, the word serpents of, often refer to crafty, cunning people. John the Baptist and Jesus both refer to the Pharisees as serpents. Now, scorpions, scorpions hold poison in their tail. A tail can be a story. So that remarks refers to people who relate deadly or poisonous stories that nothing they do will stop those whom Jesus sends. The authority to overcome these types of attacks were given to those Jesus sent out on a particular task. If he sends us on a particular task, he can equip us to overcome these things. And all the power of the enemy that comes before us will be broken because he has given us authority to go. This authority that Jesus gave his disciples to overcome these obstacles, they proved that they were from God. You know, when God empowers his servants, often they will speak into your life. And then that spoken word will be proven to be true. And then you know that it is God who said it. The Lord also empowered his disciples after he rose from the grave. And this one kind of probably applies to us a little bit more because it was after he was going to leave the earth and ascend, he gave this power. It shows the type of authority that we're given. So let's go to Romans 15, 18 through 19. For, of course, I will not venture presume to speak thus of any work except what Christ has actually done through me as an instrument for his hands, to win obedience from the Gentiles by word and deed. Even as my preaching has been accompanied with the power of signs and wonders, and all of it by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, Gentiles in this, in this description here are those who had no relationship with God. The authority to overcome the power of the enemy with signs and wonders and miracles was given because Paul was sent out to preach the gospel, the good news that Jesus had come and conquered and subdued this earth, that he was now king over heaven and earth. In order to receive that message, signs and wonders were sent to those who had not yet heard it. If a missionary is sent out, it should be accompanied with signs and miracles to confirm that this is God who is breaking the power of the enemy by delivering those oppressed by the, de by the devil himself. If there are no miracles accompanying them, we must ask ourselves, were they sent by the Lord or was this just a good idea, man hat? Were they, because they were not empowered by him. The simple truth is that we have not been given all authority to use, to use whenever we want for what we think should be done. We must be sent and empowered by our Lord for his tasks. Jesus himself clearly stated what authority we've been given in the Great Commission. This is right before he ascended, Mark 
15 or more sorry mark 16 verses 15 through 18 here's the amplified classic version go into all the world preach and publish openly the good news the gospel to every creature in the whole human race and these attesting signs will accompany those who believe in my name they will cast out demons they will speak in new tongues they will pick up serpents if they drink any deadly thing it will not hurt them and they will lay their hands on the sick and they will be made well. This entire list is comprised of things affecting man on this earth. Demons reside in man. When you speak with a new tongue, that's your physical body speaking here on this earth. Take up snakes. Well, serpents are, are animals on the earth, but we know that serpents are also men acting like snakes. So, so we'll look into that in a moment the uh, number four the fourth thing listed was we will ingest what we ingest will not harm us in this world that's also on the earth healing happens in our physical body those that are sick will be made well every one of these items is something affecting this physical world that is where the authority that that jesus gives us to use when he gives us to use it in Strong's Concordance, the Greek word mm, for take up can mean to remove from thy place. So when you see serpents are taken up, it says it could read serpents are can, can be removed from their place. So remember, this means that those empowered by Satan that are acting wickedly and, dis, and evilly can be removed from their place by the acts of those who are operating with God. It's the Holy Spirit who guides us, who tells us what to do and when to do it. Because remember, there's no condemnation for those who walk with the Spirit. To state that we have authority in heaven would contradict God's word itself. Psalms 115 verse 16, American King James Version says this, the heaven even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. Everything in the heavens are the Lord's only and his to deal with. What is on the earth he's given to man. The authority we do not have is authority in the heavens. We have come to refer to that as unauthorized authority. Now the Old Testament shows us God's ways which still applies to Christians today. The tabernacle of God, that's the tent where they had the Ark of the Covenant and where, where it was first kept, was built according to God's design. To, to see what kind of unauthorized authority there is, we can look back at what happened with this tabernacle and the Ark when God first had it erected. Ceremonies were conducted, which would foreshadow what Jesus would later fulfill. So let's look at Exodus 30, verse 9 in the English Standard Version. You shall not offer unauthorized incense on it, or a bur burnt offering or grain offering, and you shall not pour drink offering on it. If we look at Revelation 8, 3 and 4, it says, And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. So now we see that when Israel was offering incense before God, that that is a foreshadow of the prayers of the saints, that in heaven, in heavenly places, it appears as incense before God. Incense represents prayers. And Aaron was instructed how and when to burn incense continually. And that was in Exodus 30, verse 7. And we are instructed to pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. But according to God and his instructions to Aaron in that, in that verse we read in, in Exodus 30, verse 9, there is a right way and a wrong way to offer prayer. There is an unauthorized way. If we look at Leviticus 10, verses 1 and 2, this is the American King James Version, we see there what happens if we do unauthorized prayers, that there is a consequence. It says, and Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, 
took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense therein and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out a fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord when Aaron's sons acted presumptuously and they came before the Lord with their idea of, of incense, the way they wanted to do it. It was a strange fire and the Lord killed them as a result. If we are taking authority that isn't ours, then there can be dire consequences, not only for us, but for family members. A few ways we can transgress our authority are taking authority over principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places, commanding heavenly hosts, and using the blood of Jesus wrongly. Now, these are three big topics. So we're not going to actually talk about them today. This is to, at the end of today's message. But at the next Living Word, we will talk in depth about these, and we're going to give you some new examples um, about our authority. This is what the Lord says that he has for you. He wants everyone to know about their rightful authority so you can walk in it rightly. The Lord just gave me a fantastic example just today, and I know it fits in with this message. I'm just not sure where or how yet, so I'll be bringing that in the coming weeks, and I'm sure the Lord will show me exactly where it goes. I'm asking him if it goes right now, so give me a moment. Oh, Lord. Is this the time? Okay, I'm going to give you an example of when you can use rightful authority. When we can command, do you guys want an example of when we can command um, the enemy and we can make those commands and they work and then show you when it's not exactly right, okay? And it's gonna be the same example. Recently, and this was actually just last night, just last night, I was literally up past midnight because of a situation that came up. But in order for you to understand that situation, we're going to have to go back to 12 years ago. It was almost exactly 12 years ago when my daughter, Ashley, was in the seventh grade. She was in school and, and when kids hit about 12 years old, God moves, both God and the enemy begin moving strongly because they want to claim that child because they've reached the age of accountability. So you may recall this story. I've, I've talked about it before, but there's a part two that I'm giving here today. So it was Ashley was sick and she got in a cold and she just wasn't getting better. She just kept coughing and coughing. Sarah had the same cold, my other daughter. She had gotten over it, but Ashley just kept coughing and she kept coughing and it was it, you know, and, and it got so bad that she would cough so hard that she would throw up. Have you ever had a cough that bad? So here's my little tiny girl, you know, and she's just coughing and it's just horrible. And so one night we were laying in bed and we could hear her upstairs coughing. And my husband went up to go check on her to make sure she was okay. And when he did, I began praying and just talking to, with God. And I heard so clearly from the Holy Spirit, pray that she is healed. And I went, oh, Holy Spirit, you're telling me to pray? Woohoo, I know, I know it'll be done because God, you are speaking, you are telling me to. So I said with the utmost confidence and faith, Heavenly Father, I just ask right now that you heal my daughter, Ashley, that you remove the sickness from her and make her whole. Complete confidence and faith, I said in, in prayer. She keeps coughing, I can hear her. And she's still coughing. And I'm like, Holy Spirit, was that not you that told me to pray for my daughter? I prayed in faith. Why did it not happen? Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought that, oh, God tells you to pray something and it doesn't come? So I just asked God, why didn't it happen? Why, didn't, why wasn't she healed? I know I heard your voice. The Holy Spirit said, it's not a sickness. And I went, oh, okay. So that means it's a demon. So I just said, okay, thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I command that demon, that spirit, to take its hands off my daughter. In the name of Jesus, I cast you out of this house. I covered Ashley with the blood of Jesus. You know, I just went through it, you know. In the name of Jesus, I cast that demon off of my daughter. You take your hands off my child. 
And immediately she stopped coughing. My husband came down <laughs> and, and um, he got back in bed and she had stopped coughing. And then we hear this little, <clears throat> you know, and I said, don't worry, honey. She's just clearing her throat. The Holy Spirit says it's just a tickle and she's just, it, she doesn't know why her throat's tickling, but she's, the Lord healed her. because I prayed and the Lord healed her. And he goes, um, you prayed. He said, I prayed for her to be healed a while back and she wasn't healed. How come she was healed when you prayed? And I said, well, I, when I, I prayed for her, the, for, her, for her to be healed of a sickness and she didn't get any better. I asked the Lord, why not? And he said it was a demon. So I cast the demon off. It was a coughing demon. So you guys remember the post about the coughing demon? So she was healed of that cough. Well, last night, about 11 o'clock at night, my daughter had finished a soccer game, same daughter, and she's calling us and we're in bed trying to sleep. I was anyways. And now she's telling us about this game. She's telling us about how horrible her team was and how horrible, you know, they were acting all, all horrible and they weren't running and this, that, and the other thing, really frustrated. And the whole time she's coughing. She's like, <laughs> every few words, coughing. And I'm like, Ashley, are you sick? And Tony, and she says, oh no, I just got this cough. It just came out of nowhere earlier this week. And Tony goes, well, do you have a fever? And she goes, oh no, I don't have any other symptoms, just this cough. And immediately I heard coughing demon. And I knew it was that same spirit. And Ashley goes, oh, you know, is, do you think mom, it's that coughing demon that I had back when I was in junior high? <laughs> and I said, I said, I, the Holy Spirit just said that to me, that it is that demon. So I said, you know, um, you were just teaching and substituting for the first time, seventh and eighth grade. And I remember you texted me and said, man, these, these junior hires, they are all stupid and judgy. Do you think that a spirit has come upon you? I think a spirit's come upon you from that. I think you picked up a spirit there in the seventh and eighth grade that you had in the seventh and eighth grade. Um, and I think you'll need to come apart. So she asked me how to get rid of it. And I, I gave her a little text of, you know, do this, that, and the other thing, um, you know, to command it to go in Jesus name and plead and plead the blood and that. And then I went to sleep, but as I'm falling to sleep, I'm praying and, and the Holy spirit says she will need to confess her sin. You see, she was no longer 12 years old when kids are small and there are kids we can take authority over things in our life because they're under the age of an adult. Ashley's now over the age of 21. She is a full-fledged adult. And because this is a second time this demon has come, she would need to repent and confess for her sins. So I called her back and I'm like, hey, I was trying to go to sleep. And the Lord said that there's some sins attached to this that you're going to need to confess, repent, and take care of. And she's like, okay, so I have to confess and repent. What else do I have to do? She's like, I'm really tired. And I'm like, remember, confess, repent, plead the blood. And so I sent that in a text to her too. And I'm like, okay, so confess for judging others. When did that start? You go back and say, okay, I now realize that I've been listening to a wrong spirit by judging others harshly. And so she did that and, and has taken care of that spirit. But you see, there's a right way and a wrong way to, and a wrong time to command a demon to go. Even when it's in someone, even when you know it's a demon, you have to listen to the Holy Spirit. When she was 12, that very same demon, the Holy Spirit said just to command it in my name and, and plead the blood and it was done. But when she was a full-fledged adult, I couldn't take care of it for her. I could guide her about the way to do it but it's up to her to confess for her, her walk to remove that demon. So that's the story the Lord has for you about your authority today. Yes, Jesus has given us authority over demons upon this earth, but we have to know when and when to use them. If I had tried to command that spirit to be gone from my daughter over the phone, I would have transgressed into unauthorized authority. The Holy Spirit was was kind of giving me a check about doing it right then. It was time for her to learn, her to learn to walk with the Holy Spirit on her own, her, her time to use God's authority in, in a right way and to know that sometimes it, it requires us to turn from sin if we want to remove a spirit from our life. So that 
is the message about our authority for you today. There is a right authority. There are strange prayers that the Lord didn't authorize. Make sure you're walking according to him and listening to him and the Holy Spirit. If you want to learn more about hearing from the Holy Spirit, start the online classes. Um, schedule a Let's Chat and so we can help you get started on the free online classes. We're not trying to sell you anything, none of the materials. We're not going to charge you for anything. Um, we just want you to be able to learn and to get free. So that is our message today. Thank you for joining me for the Living Word. Again, next week we will continue looking about looking into our authority with our Lord. Do we have questions? Let's ask for questions here today. If you have joined us on Zoom or YouTube, you can place your questions in chat. Do you have any questions about your authority thus far? Why you do not have authority in the heavens? That's just at the beginning. We'll be addressing principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places next week. Jason, Courtney, do we have any questions? Uh, I have one question so far. So when she was 12, she couldn't confess for her words, but you could cast it out through prayer. At 12, she was just barely in the age of accountability where she was learning right from wrong. And when they're young, you can take authority over spirits in their life um, through the authority of the Lord. When they, as they get older, God expects them to learn and to be willing to turn from things. So at 12, the Lord wanted her to see that there was power, that there was, that he had power to deliver her. The next morning I did get up and I said, Hey, we you know what happened last night. You started doing a little tiny cough at the end there. And she goes, yeah, my throat had a little tickle in it. I said, yeah, the Lord said that what was happened. I, and I told her about um, casting out the demon in Jesus name. So see, that was an example that she remembered years later. And so the Lord had a purpose in doing it that way. So when your children are young, when they're not yet adults, especially when they're age of, of 10 to 14, the Lord's, you have authority in their life, um, as their parent. And you are able sometimes to use the name of the blood to get rid of demons that are pestering them. Next question, Jason, did that answer that one? Yes, and um, I have another question here. Can you confess for her when she was 12? If the Lord told me, and if I knew what the Lord told me, that um, you can confess that on her behalf that her ancestors were guilty, but at 12, um, they have to begin learning right from wrong. So you want to be careful. You can confess that... Um, she doesn't know and ask the Lord for wisdom as the Lord reveals it to you. At this point, he didn't reveal anything she needed to turn from, just she needed to know his power. So remember, under the age of 18, you have legal authority over your children. That means you can say, Heavenly Father, I come before you as the legal representative for my daughter so-and-so. And as their legal representative, I confess that both they and their ancestors have sinned against you. And then that way you can cover those ancestors' sins for the for your child and get all of that under the blood. But you have to confess that they have sinned as well as the ancestors to remove it between ages eight or 12 and 18. Next question, Jason. It's um, somebody's asking about 12 to 14 in between the ages of 12 and 14 is when both sides, good and evil, make a, an appearance in a child's life to try and get them to go in the in that direction. So I see that children of the righteous uh, God will appear between the ages of 12 and 14 or 10 and 14 and start working, doing miracles um, so that they can recognize God and follow him. But sometimes um, the enemy will also try and enact uh, generational curses and the enemy will start moving strongly in a child's life as well. But if you're a righteous parent, I think that's parent. I think that's why the Lord allowed me to rebuke the demon is to keep the enemy away from my daughter at age 12. We have another question here. What to do when you don't know if the ancestors did that sin? Remember the ways, and we talk about this in the gen a class on generational curses, the free one in the in the church, that you can find if it 
if your ancestors are guilty, because if your mother, brother, sister, aunt, if they're if, if you see it a pattern of different people, it can be just your aunt and a sibling. It can be all your siblings. It, you know, if you can see the same sin within the family line, um, you know, if you're uh, then you know that most likely this is a generational curse. The other way you know that if it's a generational curse and your ancestors are guilty is if something attacks you under the age of 12. Under the age of 12, you're still considered an innocent, not knowing good from evil. And often when something comes on a child, there's a generational link there. Um, so oh, it depends on what the item is. Because Jesus did say that when his disciples said, oh, this young boy, he's um, manifesting, remember, the from the mute spirit, who sinned? Was it him? Was it his parents? Who sinned that this child should be such afflicted? And Jesus said it was just for the glory of God. So these are general guidelines. We always have to listen to the Holy Spirit. But there's a good indication if something happens before the age of 12 that there is a generational sin involved. Okay, that is our meeting today. Thank you for joining the Living Word. Um, let's pray and place you in the hands of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for bringing wisdom about your ways and about your the authority that you've given us. Lord, we want to appropriate all the authority you have given us so that your kingdom can come and your will can be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Show us our rightful authority, our rightful place. Help us to hear clearly from your spirit when we are to take authority in a situation. But teach us, Lord, your ways, for we do not want to step on your toes. We do not want to be the head. You are our head and our leader, and we want to listen to you about our authority. In the name of Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Okay. Until next week, shalom.